Hey guys, hope you guys are all doing well. We have an exciting treat for you today. For all the people that watch us on YouTube, we have a lot of Elvis Presley fans. And we promised you we would be back and bring you more Elvis Presley content. And we are with our friend, Mr. Turner, the director here at Elvis Presley's birthplace. Hello. Hey. Thank you so much for having us. Oh, my pleasure. And thank you. Um, we started talking a couple of months ago, and uh, we had reached out to him and, and let him know that we were interested in coming here and doing a little filming because we, ha uh, we filmed in Graceland uh, last summer, and everyone loved our Elvis Presley content. And some people said we had some of the best videos on YouTube. And we love our Elvis Presley, so we were so excited to be back and spend some time with you. Well, so thank you. So we are in Tupelo, Mississippi, the birthplace of Elvis Aaron Presley. So we're going to let Mr. Turner talk more about Mr. Elvis Presley's birthplace because we are so excited to show you this today and we're honored to be here. So again, thank you so much for having us. Yeah, it guys. means a lot. And thank you to all our subscribers that watch us and fell in love with our Elvis content because we promise it's not over today. We will be bringing you more, and we will be back to Graceland. So, this is where Elvis Presley was born. This is where he was born. Uh, our slogan is, you walk in the front door, it says, where Elvis played first. Right. And that's a, a play on words in two ways. He played here as a child, and he also first played his music here. Uh, this place was very special to I'm local. I've been the local Elvis historian since 1981. That's awesome. Uh, I grew up here in East Tupelo, went to the same school, and some of the same teachers. Some of his cousins were in my class. My father worked with his mother in the garment plant oh, that was before I was born. Uh, my youngest daughter married last year out here in our event center, and her husband is four cousins of Elvis. Wow. I've just been inundated with Elvis all my life. Oh, okay. <laughs> I like to tell the story. You know, when Elvis was 10 years old, he entered the talent show at our local fair, and he came in fifth place. 11 years later, he comes back, 21 years old, the hottest thing in America, uh -huh. and does what he calls his homecoming concert in 1956 in the puppy sleeve velvet. Uh -huh. When it's over, he gives the money back to our mayor and says, I noticed the house I was born in, in 15 acres of the sale. I want you to buy it and build a park for the kids of East Tupelo. This was the poor side of town, the wrong side of the tracks. I was the only kid, by the way. We didn't know we were poor. We just knew we weren't, we weren't rich. He came back the following year, did another concert, gave that check, and said, I want you to build a youth center for those kids. In this main building, all of the area that's brick, it's that original youth center. You see that window? Okay, it's the all over This you. was originally a parking lot. That's where we'd go up to the window and put our money down and say, I want to go swim in and give me a coat and a soda bottle. I had my first dance in ninth grade in what's now our museum. Oh. And I will show you this. I want to turn around to the camera. Oh. I am about 12 in that the picture. Awesome. That sign was right here to the side of the building. Okay. Elvis was 21 years old when he did this. I think it's amazing that he was thinking about others at 21 years old. Because I have to be honest, I wasn't thinking about Correct. It. Yeah, we're not thinking that in advance. And I also like to say, you know, 10 years old, fifth place, 11 years later, the very same stage, and he's the hottest thing in America. That is the American story. That is, that really is. That's a dream. Absolutely. Um, he lived in this birth house mm -hmm. until he was three years old. Until he was three. Yeah. And we're going to check that out. It's right behind us. We're going to go in there in a little bit. Yeah. As most fans know, his father, uh, the story has been, I even told the wrong story for many years mm -hmm. because I was told what older people told me. And then a few years ago, I was able to get his father's actual records from Parchment Penitentiary. Wow. And about the time Elvis was three, 
Vernon participates in a check forgery along with Gladys's brother and a friend of theirs, mm-hmm. and he's sentenced to 13 years in the state penitentiary. Gladys can't keep payments upon the house. So they moved to South Tupelo, and with her aunt and uncle on Maple Street, that house is still there. Vernon, uh, well, while he's in prison, Gladys works tirelessly to get in part. She circulates three petitions in this neighborhood. She solicits everybody with just an ounce of influence to write a letter on his behalf. And the gentleman that he worked for, that he'd actually forged the check on, uh, even wrote a letter on his behalf saying, this is a fine man, uh, a young man. I think he's learned this lesson and I wish you would consider pardoning him. And he was pardoned after that. Point. They continued to live with her aunt and uncle. Uh, for maybe another six months, Vernon got to work, got on his feet, and he bought a house down here on Berry Street. Because they get several houses, I think, here, right? Uh, about 14 all the time. Wow, because they had to keep moving. Yeah. Okay, and we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, mm-hmm. They lived in the house on Berry for about a year, and then Vernon sold it. And some of his contemporaries said that he blew the money. I'm not judging, I'm just repeating, Correct. you know, mm-hmm. but contemporaries say. So then they rented a couple of houses on Kelly. They rented one on Mulberry Alley downtown, which was sandwiched between Main Street and the Fairgrounds. And then across Main Street was Shake Ground. And that was one of the two African American communities. Then the final residence was 1010 North Green Street, which was in the other African American. We lived there about 14 months. And you can see uh, Sam Bell's story over there on the wall. Okay. I knew Sam. Sam was his childhood friend. Mm-hmm. This was late 47, 1948. Mm-hmm. Segregated South. Uh-huh. Sam said they would spend the night at each other's house. And they would go to the theater at the Lyric to watch movies. Elvis would go in the front door. Sam had to enter the side bar. When they got upstairs, Elvis would pop over and sit in that section with Sam. And Sam said, nobody ever about this. He also said, Sam was raised by his grandparents. His father had been killed in World War II and his mother had moved north to find work. And he said that his grandparents thought the world was little 13-year-old Elvis because he would say, yes, sir, and yes, ma'am. And white people did not afford that kind of respect back then. That's the time that he got exposed to the blues and shake rag and what Sam called the sanctified church gospel, which from my experience, it's the African-American version of white Pentecostal gospel. They're both awesome, but yet different Mm -hmm. because each folk brought their own sound. And that's, you know, where he uh, first heard says he'd already been exposed to country mm-hmm. and, and to white gospel. Those were the four genres that he heard here as a kid. And Sam said they would be out playing, and Elvis would hear music, and off he went. Mm-hmm. And he said, we'd usually just trail alone. Uh, if you saw the Elvis movie last year. Oh, we did. We re- love the Elvis movie. It was awesome. It was awesome. The Tip Revival. But little Elvis, yes. if the Holy Spirit, Sam Bell told me that story for the first time in 2007. So that was a true story. Absolutely. Because you heard it from the mouth of himself. That's awesome. That is awesome. And I will say this about the movie, because I went to it with some trepidation, mm-hmm. because they usually mess up. Same thing with the family. They were, you know, I know Priscilla, Lisa, Marie, they were all... You know, right. how it was going to go a little skeptical. And, Usually, yeah. Hollywood biopics take so many creative licenses that it's not good. Baz Luhrmann and Austin Butler came here to this first place before the first frame was ever started. They spent the entire day going through and reading and rereading every page. Then Baz went to the trouble to go find where Sam lived and get him to the door which was a miracle in itself, but yeah. Sam did discover it all three. Wow. And he filmed an hour-long interview with Sam, which he then posted on his YouTube channel. So it was well-researched, and the end product was also in my So let me get back to my story. Um, 
It's good stuff too. No, I mean, this is amazing. This is like amazing stories that you're telling from your family and yep. personal experiences. It doesn't get any better than this. People like your family that knew Elvis Presley. This operated as a part for years. And Elvis didn't just give the money and forget. One of his other childhood friends, Guy Harris, uh, he kept in touch with him. Guy said that he would get a call. Uh, Guy became a local policeman. Uh, he said he'd get a call and said, Guy, it's Elvis. Can you meet me up on the hill? Meaning this hill, not a few behind this hill. And Guy would come and he said, Elvis would just be dressed in normal cage. And then stand on that hill, he'd look down at all the kids. And he'd say, Are a bunch of them using the pool? Are they using the ball field? Uh, is it a good thing? Mm -hmm. Guy said Elvis did that three or four times. So he kept a vested interest in it. I feel from all the research I've done over the years and the people I've interviewed, some of Elvis's best memories happened in Eagle, Mississippi. And one reason I say that, he would bring his friends down uh, and new acquaintances, especially if they were going to become part of that inner circle to take them around and show them everything. About eight years ago, Priscilla came to it. And, uh, and uh, she said, while she was married to Elvis, they came to people about five times. He said, usually a Sunday afternoon, about three o'clock, you get up and come downstairs. He said, hey, that's what people. Mm -hmm. She said, they would just drive around saying, we well, went to school, of course here, buy cheap little hardware, the creek, that he played and swam in as a kid. So it had to be warm, fuzzy memories for him. But he was nearly 14 years old when he left. Those are your formative years. When you yeah. learn the things that will define what kind of a goal you're going for. And this is where it all started. So for years, this operated as a part of the youth center. Then when Elvis passed away, which is interesting, uh, we had just bought a house maybe the, a month before just down the street. So I got off work and went by sewer to make a payment on the refrigerator that I joke and say it would be 40 years to pay for. Mm -hmm. And as I was parking the car and came on the radio, the world had died. So by the time I got here and passed this little birth house, there was a guy, Steve Megginson, hanging a wreath on the door. When I got up to go to work the next morning, that little porch was overflowing flowers that was didn't call them everywhere. But that, that, that's where this needs to go, but it's all I thought of it. Yeah, no, it's it's so part for, of... For years, Elvis. this operated as a park in Houston. And then when Elvis died, the city got money from all over the world saying, do something for Elvis. He had told a friend here, if the city ever did anything for him, he would like to see what place built that his fans would go and meditate. And that's how that little brown thing glass chapel got there. And we do not charge to go with a chapel because Elvis wanted to play for Spans to go and meditate with his gospel place in there all the time. Then, as more and more tourists came, the city uh, decided that it didn't need to be a part in the use of it. Plus, we had other facilities by the way. Then, this became. Uh, a community center. We would have our Turner family reunions there every year. The Presley would have their family reunions there every year. Mm -hmm. What's now our mm -hmm. museum area. Uh, in fact, my mother and father, we held their golden wedding anniversary. So as more and more tourists came, uh, a foundation was spinning to run this. And our boards comprised of some local business because I was on that board before I did. Um, and over the past 20 years, it has just been so well managed and maintained. It's beautiful. We haven't even done the ground yet. They had the foresight yeah. to buy that little church when it became available, have it moved up here and restored. Um, we've added on the event center, the theater. We added a statue up the top that we call the Tummy. Everything on this side of the building deals with Elvis the boy. 
because that's our story. Mm -hmm. He started but as the young Graceland boy. tells the story of Elvis the Entertainer. Yeah. But on the back side of the property, we do highlight Elvis the Entertainer. And at the top of that hill are two statues, which you may have already noticed. A little Elvis sitting on the milk crate with a guitar, and a 70s spread eagle Elvis standing behind him. So on the website, I can't wait to see that. Because Elvis himself said he used to sit on that hill on the milk crate and dream oh. about being a famous singer. Oh, beautiful. And the fans from all over the world that I visit with uh, day in and day out uh, love this place. The serenity, uh, a lot of them say they can feel his spirit. Mm -hmm. And going back to Priscilla's visit, mm -hmm. she said Elvis would be very pleased with what he did. She said, you know, he didn't like accolades. And when he was nominated for the Grammy, he said, why are you doing this? Uh, mm -hmm. I'm just doing what I love. Mm -hmm. She said that he would be so pleased with how humble this has been done and the serenity of the property. So that made us feel. Well, he was very humble. Yeah. You know, and it's funny because on the way here, me and my husband were talking about how Elvis feared that he would be forgotten. Absolutely. You know, once he reached 40, he was always afraid yep. of that. And only if he can see today, which he may be up from the heavens, yep. you know, watching down on us, hopefully, um, how we never forgot him. Mm -hmm. And so many years later, we're still continuing his legacy. Yes. And it is a beautiful, beautiful thing. And that shows you how much love and how much he inspired the world. His music the person he was, he was a huge person that gave a lot to charity mm -hmm. and donated a lot of money. We learned about that in our Graceland video. Um, and he was just a really good person that really tried to help people and truly always wanted to give so many gifts to his, his friends, his family. He always stayed humble and true to his roots mm -hmm. and true to his faith. Mm -hmm. I think that was one thing that I could teach to him. Mm -hmm. He never refused to autograph. He never refused to have a picture made. I'm quoting George Klein and some others on that because I wasn't there. Mm -hmm. But they have stressed and, and told how his little entourage would be trying to rush him up and say, come on, and say no. Mm -hmm. These are the people that put us through. Yeah. He appreciated that and he never did not. And I think that was a lot of his appeal. And again, in business with people from all over the world, and they tell me their Elvis connection, mm -hmm. uh, most of whom never saw him. But he has carried them through troubling times. Uh, he's been there when they're celebrating. He's been there when they're mourning. Uh, I mean, how many people that have lived in our lifetime or in the past, uh, let's say the 20th century, that left that kind of an impact. And a lot of these people, that happened to them after his death. You know, it's, it's a remarkable one. And we were born in 79 before he, we were born after he passed away. Mm -hmm. You know, but our parents, you know, we grew up listening to the music, watching the movies, mm -hmm. watching the videos. And also he loved New Orleans. Mm -hmm. So we have a new, we have a YouTube channel out of New Orleans. We show people why we love living there. And he did a movie, King Creel, which they said was one of his best movies. Mm -hmm. So one day we're going to do a video on that because um, we do live in New Orleans. And I think that would be awesome to pay a tribute to him in the city that he truly did love. Sure. But uh, I mean, this is very peaceful here, just sitting so here with you and the beautiful fountain. Now, does that fountain resemble anything? Is there any significance with the fountain? That's called the Fountain of Life. It's from 1935 to 1948. The 13, almost 14 years that uh, he was here. Oh. Just like we have a walk of life around the house. And each block, each year, there's something that happened in his childhood highlighted. That is beautiful. That is very nice. That's and then we have the story boards with quotes from James Osborne, Sam Bell, and Guy Harris, okay. with, with three of his closest childhood friends. And the other story boards are, are people that knew him and interacted with him. Like there's Mr. Bobo, who sat on the guitar. Bitsy Savory, who, who was a friend 
but not in the sense that James and Sam and Guy were. They were running cohorts as little boys. Ditsy was from a very wealthy family. In fact, it's his father that ran the fair and got Elvis to come back to do the 1956 concert. Around on the back, we have a clerk from his fifth grade teacher, Mrs. Alika Grimes, from another friend, uh, Jackie uh, Prayford. Um, a relative, Miss Annie Presley. The, these are a few things we remember. And when we did the boards, we did it in the vernacular in which they spoke. Because it, it tells a lot of the story, their speech patterns, the words they use, or the way they may not use a word exactly proper. But this was what he was exposed to. These are the ingredients he made that he was. And that's what we tried to preserve. And every, there are 22 venues on this property. And there's a guidebook, or you can scan the QR codes, that mm -hmm. tells you the significance behind each one. There's a lot of symbolism here. Okay. And to really get everything out of it, that uh, people take time to read and see that symbolism, the ones that do always come back just wow. Mm -hmm. That's about it in that field, if you have a specific question. <laughs> no, I think, I think it's amazing what you do. You know, and you obviously had a love and passion, you know, for Elvis at a young age. Well, I'll do my history. Okay. Uh, as I told you earlier, my dad had worked with his mother in the garment plant. But I never knew that. Mm -hmm. I grew up in East Tupelo, just as he did. I joke, I made my singing debut in fifth grade in Lawhorn School on the same stage he did. I don't know what the hell went wrong. <laughs> That's my You're joke. Yeah, that's good. Uh, I'm exactly what I'm But you're to perfect. Do. You're talented just like him. Uh, and as I said, I went to school with some of his cousins, had some of his trained teachers. I saw him as a kid. I swam, me and my buddies, we swam and played in the same creek he did. He was free. Okay. It was a little, at that time, a little narrow gravel road and a wooden bridge. And for us, it was the Amazon River. Mm -hmm. Our imagination. Yeah. We were leaving one day and we had to get over to the side to let this black bar pass. And as we passed, the back window was bad. And one of us said, huh, I've been like Elvis. And then we just went to peddling our bicycles. Mm -hmm. Later, when I started learning about his life and learned how he would bring people down here to show where he went to school, where he was born, where he swam, mm -hmm. I know I saw him. Like he came to my school when I was in third grade to visit the fifth grade teacher, Mrs. Olita Grind. Okay. My teacher said, boys and girls, be quiet, I'll be right back, and as soon as he leaves, you know, we got the We just knew he was going to go perform on that same stage and get us out of match. So they surprised you. But that sucker stood us up. He visited with his teacher in the Oh, no. Uh, okay. I saw most of Elvis's movies that were done in the 60s, because I went to the Lyric Theater once a week and saw anything that played. Uh, I liked those movies that he hated. Mm -hmm. At that age, they were very entertaining. Mm -hmm. I bought some of his records. But I wasn't what you call an Elvis fan. Then in 1981, a lady came here from London to write the first serious Elvis biography, Elvis and Gladys. Mm -hmm. Her name was Elaine Bundy. She asked a local library, was there locals she could hire to help her if it was the local history and for the honesty. They suggested me. We stayed here for five months and at the end of the summer. I said, you know, I'm really sad because I've enjoyed this. I don't know if I'm going to see you again. But I said, oh no, we're going to work together again. Like, hmm. That's kind of looked at the mission. Mm -hmm. Well, it took her four years to write the book. I continued to find people, interview them, photographs, court documents. So when the book came out, she dedicated it to me. And I did help her with the book. So we became lifelong friends. By the way, she was 60 and I was 29 when she came. So about 2001, she said, uh, you know, I'm getting older. And when I die, I want to set up the foundation in Tupelo to expose the little illnesses to the arts. That's the way she said it. And I want you to oversee it. Aww. And she was from a wealthy family. Mm -hmm. um, she passed in 2008, and I said, the Elaine Bundy and Roy Turner and Gallup for the Arts. It has grown to around a million dollars. 
and I get 5% of the interest that it makes every year. So I dole out in all kinds of programs that have touched kids' lives. That's a beautiful thing. That's part of Elaine Dundee's legacy. It's also part of Elvis's legacy. The way he continues to touch lives through other people. And the foundation is still donating. Yes. You know, and still helping people and children, and that's beautiful. So, uh, that started my Elvis journey. Uh -huh. I found so many similarities in our lives. When I did his mother's genealogy, I discovered his third great grandmother was a Cherokee Indian named Norman mm -hmm. Dove White. Mm -hmm. Another third of fourth great grandmother was Jewish. My family came from the same background, either a family farm or care brothers. They moved into this area to go to work in the garment plant for a better way of life. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a whole lot better. Um, my sister and I were the first in my family to get a high school diploma. Elvis was the first in his family to get a high school diploma. His mother was determined to get that high school diploma. And just like my parents were, because that was something they did. And you know, when we started researching, and we would hear stories how he was a mama's boy, and his mother would walk him to school. He walked into school because some of the boys were playing hoochies, and she didn't know him playing hoochies. Mm -hmm. Because James Osborne and Sam Bell and Guy Harris all told me that their escapades that Mama was nowhere around. Uh, she did not have them tied to her hoochie. Mm -hmm. But he was very close to his mother. Mm -hmm. That nine months his father spent in um, prison is when they bonded. And that bond was so tight that I don't think Burnham could have wedged himself into it, no matter how hard he tried. Gladys's contemporaries told us, as a little three-year-old, he'd be running around playing, and he'd get to his mama and he'd put the brakes on and he'd go, it's all right, mama, I'm going to take care of you. Aww. And by God, he did. He did. For the day she died. He loved Three years his old. Mother. I could relate to that, mm -hmm. because my father was... Um, a somewhat abusive alcoholic, oh. always threatening to kill one or more of us, oh, and yeah. what had you. And I can remember as early as five years old, feeling like I had to take care of my mother. So I can relate to how mm -hmm. Elvis got that. Yeah, you can. So after Elvis and Gladys, Peter Goralnik called me, oh, they need to know if I could help him with last train to Memphis. I did just a little, not to the extent I did mm -hmm. uh, land. And then um, Pat Brusky, who along with Peter Harry Brown did uh, Down at the End of Lonely Street. And later I helped Atlanta Nash a little with uh, Baby Let's Play House. I also served on the local Tupelo Film Commission. And the only people that ever came here wanted to film, and guess what? All this documentary filmmakers from all over the world. I would set up the location shots, the interviews, and I had an idea for a documentary, and I kept talking about it. My buddy, who served on the Commission with us, and when are you going to shut up talking about it? Let's do it. Mm -hmm. So we shot it, premiered it at our 2006 Elvis Festival. Mm -hmm. I had met a guy here shooting for the Travel Channel and said, that When you finish it, send it to me, let me see what I can do with it. Long story short, he was able to take our film and sell that concept to Aileen's Vlogger Channel. And if you've ever seen Elvis Return to Tupelo, mm -hmm. that story is my idea. I'm a co producer. I'm a co producer. Oh. By the way, I never made any money. Mm -hmm. I was just doing all this. Series. For your love and passion. It came like a hobby yeah. and a passion. You have a love. The more I learned, the more I wanted to know. And, and God had put me in the right place mm -hmm. at the right time to get to know these people and mm -hmm. learn their stories before they left this world. Mm -hmm. So when this job came available, I retired after 48 and a half years with the same cupcake company. To come take this job. I love it. And I love every day. I love the people coming. I love interacting with them. Mm -hmm. I'm having the most fun I've ever had in my life. That's awesome. And you're, I mean, you're amazing at everything you've done to keep his legacy, you know, continuing yeah. and generation and generations learn, you know, about well, Elvis Presley. It's not, it's not me. I don't want to take credit for that. No. But you are someone that had a big part in continuing I, his legacy here I did have at a, his birthplace. I did have a part. Mm -hmm. uh, we have been blessed with a wonderful board that had the passion 
and the foresight. And we've been blessed with the staff that has the passion for what they do. Yep. None of them are just punching the clock mm -hmm. and drawing a paycheck. Yeah. They literally have a passion. Yes, they do. And thank you to everyone that helped, you know, keep this going and, you know, continuing his legacy. Not not just Mr. Turner, but everybody, the board that helped, you know, put this together, you know, and this is amazing what you guys have done. Any Elvis fan, or even if you don't know Elvis, just to come here and literally see the beauty of this. And we haven't even gone around the ground yet. We're about to do that next, but I, this is absolutely beautiful. Well, thank you. And you guys do an amazing job with what you do. I've done a lot of research before we came here, you know, and learning about his birthplace. Uh, you know, because we are Elvis fans, you know, our parents were Elvis fans, you know, and it's just, it's amazing to be here. It's an honor to be here, you know, to see this, you know, in person and, you know, to literally see everything, you know, that has been put together to carry on his legacy. Well, we're glad so, you're here. Go enjoy thank you. it. Oh, we will. Thank, thank you. you so much for your time. You're welcome. Thank you for being awesome and just thank you for everything that you do and all your hard work to keep his legacy going.